So we are continuing our sermon series called The Prodigals. And I pray I don't preach all of whatever Steve has left in the series. Uh, but we're talking today um, about something really, really important. We're going to cover a very popular and well-known story. But let me give you a quick recap of last week. Uh, first of all, Pastor Steve talked about the three parables in Luke chapter 15. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, or the story of two sons, something like that. They are about God receiving sinners. God receiving sinners. And we see that at the beginning of chapter 15. In verse 2, it says, And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They had a real problem with this, so Jesus begins to tell them stories about the sheep, the coin, and the son. All the parables have something lost and something found. Something lost and then something found. But the third story begins to change the rules or change the pattern rather than the first two. So let's talk about that today. This story is often known as the parable of the prodigal son. Anybody ever heard that word before, the prodigal son? Now, real quick, and this isn't necessarily part of the entire sermon, but I want to let you know because most people hear the word prodigal, and we think it means somebody who's left and comes back, right? Oh, the prodigal son has returned, the prodigal this, the prodigal... That's not what prodigal means. Let me tell you what it means. Prodigal means spending money or resources freely and recklessly wastefully extravagant. That's what prodigal means. That's why he's the prodigal son, not because he comes back, because he goes out and blows everything. We're going to talk more about that as we go through the story. You see, the main character in the first two stories is the seeker. You've got that shepherd who goes out and seeks for the sheep. You've got that woman who seeks for that lost coin. The main character is the seeker. But in this parable, the one being sought after plays a much bigger role. The one being sought after plays a much bigger role. And today, we'll focus on that character known as the younger brother. Because in this parable, there are three real big main characters. Today, we're going to focus on the younger brother. So if you've got your Bibles or your smart device, you can turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, it's also going to be on the screen. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. I'm going to start in verse 11 and read down through verse 24. So let's start Luke 15, verse 11. He also said, a man had two sons. This, starts the, this is he, that's Jesus. He's again telling another story. A man has two sons. Starts off the same way. There's a man who had 100 sheep, a woman who had 10 coins, a man who had two sons. Starts off exactly the same, but he's going to shake up the pattern just a little bit. Verse 12. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Remember, how many sons did he have? Two. To them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. Notice this verse. He gathers together and then he squanders. This, this word squander is an antonym to gather. He gathered it and then he scattered it. He just spent it everywhere. Okay, so that's where he's at right now. Verse 14. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up Go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, 
His father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And God bless the reading of Scripture. Amen. Now, I want to just make a side note here. This story seems like it wraps up like the other two. Lost a sheep, brought it back, they celebrated. Lost a coin, got it back, they celebrated. Lost a son, came back, they celebrated. But that's not where this story ends. And so today we're focusing on this, but make sure you keep coming back because Pastor Steve is going to cover the rest of this story, as Paul Harvey used to say. So let's look at the younger son. There's three movements of the younger son in this story, three movements, and let's walk through those. First of all, we have his rebellion. We have his rebellion. The younger brother asks for what is his. He says, give me what is mine. This is the selfish desire. You can see Genesis chapter 3 where the serpent tricks the woman and she has this selfish desire for the fruit. It looks good. It tastes good. It's good for wisdom. I want it. I'm going to reach out and take it. And the son has the exact same thing here. He wants what is his. He asks for his inheritance and his independence. Hey, pop, give me what's mine, and I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. So give me what's mine. Give me my inheritance. Now, if you don't know what an inheritance is, it's usually what you get after somebody dies. Now, culturally, they could have given some gifts to their children before they died, but it's fairly uncommon and was left for after death. Even Proverbs talks about this. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21 says, An inheritance gained prematurely will not be blessed ultimately. So this was already in their text. And so when Jesus told this story, the original audience would have been like, How dare he? I can't believe this. And so they're on the edge of their seat. I bet Jesus was a great storyteller. I bet they're on the edge of their seat already. So then he goes far away and he lives foolishly. Some of your Bibles might say riotously. He lives a foolish life. Now this Greek word for foolish is asotos. Asotos, now that word means nothing but <laughs> to us. But what it does mean, it's a negative of the word saved, which in Greek is sozo. It's a negative of the word saved, which is sozo. Now here's the thing, if I said somebody is loving, and then I wanna say somebody else is not loving, I would say they are unloving, right? It's the negative tacked onto that word. Same thing as somebody's kind, somebody's not kind, they're unkind. And so the negative here of this word saved, and again, we have to be careful when we literally translate words because sometimes it doesn't mean exactly that, but this idea, he was living an unsaved life, or Better yet, he was living an unsavable lifestyle. And why was he unsavable? Because he was in rebellion to his father and their way of life. That's what he was doing with foolish and riotous living. So then he runs out of money during a famine. Bad to be in a famine, even worse to have no money during that famine. He runs out of money. So what he does is he went to work for someone is most likely a Gentile because he had to take care of pigs. Now this, this phrase here, he went to work for somebody, it means he glued himself to that person. Same thing you get in Genesis 2 whenever it says a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, glues himself to his wife. They are connected. That's what this phrase here means. He glued himself to this person because he had no other options left and so he connects himself to this person to take care of pigs. Now, you may have heard this before, but pigs, not good in the Jewish culture. 
They don't eat pork. They don't eat bacon. I can't believe it. Bacon's delicious. That's not in my notes, but that was free. But they do not deal with pigs. So much so that pigs were unclean animals and being around them or touching them would have made him unclean. You see, in Jewish culture, they had unclean things. If you touched them, you became unclean. So you had to go through certain rituals to become clean again. So he's with the pigs and becomes unclean. I want you to hold on to that because we're going to talk about it in just a little bit. Remember, he is unclean. So he's at rock bottom, he's alone, and he has nothing because he's in rebellion. Now, I want you to notice the pattern change from the first two parables. The sheep and the coin aren't rebelling. The sheep didn't go up to the shepherd and say, hey, I'm tired of sharing all this grass. Give me my grass. I'm going to head out to this field over here and do my own thing. That's not what happened. The coin's like, I'm sick of hanging on this necklace with these other coins. Just give me my stuff and I'll leave. They didn't rebel. The son, the younger brother, he rebels. He's in rebellion against the father. Yes, there was a separation of the sheep. There was a separation of the coin. But now we see a direct choice that causes the separation. It is rebellion. It is the garden picture of them taking what they wanted and rebelling against what God had said. So first we have his rebellion. Secondly, we have his return. We have his return. It says he came to his senses. This is a Hebrew idiom that means like the light came on, you know, the light bulb over his head. It's used a few times in scripture. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 47 says, and when they come to their senses. Uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 11 says, when Peter came to himself. And so it's this idea that Something's clicking. I'm, can you imagine he's there in the field with the pigs and he came to his senses? Yeah, I bet he did because he had nothing else to do. He's like, well, what am I going to do? And this is what he realizes when he comes to his senses. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son of my father. He has lost his position in his mind. And he says, you know, even the hired workers have plenty to eat and I'm sitting here dying of hunger. Now remember those hired servants for a moment because he thinks I'm just gonna go home and say, make me one of your hired servants. So this is what he does. He's gotta get up and go. You see, he doesn't just think, oh no, I'm so sad and lonely. He says, no, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna do something about it. And notice, it doesn't say he went and took a shower. He doesn't get his life right. He doesn't disconnect from something. He gets up and he goes. And that's the important part of this return. He gets up and he goes. So then it says, when he was a long way off, we don't know how long, Jesus wasn't like, he didn't get the measuring tape out and measure, but he's like a long way off. What happens? The father sees him and he runs to embrace him. Now, Pastor Steve talked last week about how it would have been shameful for a man to run at this point. But here he is. It says he's filled with compassion and he runs to the son. I always love this picture because to see him afar off means he would have had to been looking for him. So all this time, we don't know how long he was gone. Jesus doesn't give us that detail, but we know he was gone for a while. And when he's coming back, the father's been looking for him this whole time. And he sees him and he runs to him. Now, I want to I read another scripture here. In my small group, we've been reading through Genesis very slowly. I think we'll finish it in 2027. But and all my small groups like, uh, you know. But it's a, it's a great book. Everything comes back to Genesis. It, it's a good book. Anyway, so we're reading the story of Jacob and Esau. Now, if you don't know that story, Jacob and Esau are twin brothers. Esau's the older. He comes out first. But Jacob is chosen by God even before they're born. But here's what Jacob does. He really royally messes up Esau's life. He takes away his birthright for some soup. He takes away the blessing, he hides and dresses up like Esau, and the father gives the blessing to Jacob. Jacob has to run because Esau's going to kill him. It's this whole big mess. And so at one point, 
Esau and Jacob come back together. They've already gone out. They got their own families, their own livestock, their whole thing. And Jacob's like, he's going to kill me. And he sets up his family. <laughs> it's, you read the story. He sets up, he's like, good. I'll set this part of my family. If he kills them, at least we'll have time to get out of here. Jacob's a hot mess. He really is. Which tells me that God chooses people not based on how great they're going to be, but because God is great. So here's what happens. Esau comes to Jacob, and in Genesis 33, verse 4, this is what it says. <clears throat> but Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him, and then they wept. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? My gosh. This Jewish audience would have immediately picked up on this. It's the story of two sons, an older and a younger. They would have immediately picked up on this. You got Cain and Abel. You got Ishmael and Isaac. You got Jacob and Esau. David was younger. Moses was young. Always this younger and older kind of thing going on. They would have picked up on that. And then Jesus imports this text straight into this story. And they're like, oh my gosh, what does this represent? Well, it showcases forgiveness. In fact, Jacob wants to give some stuff to Esau. He's like, take some of my stuff. And Esau's like, I have stuff, brother. I don't need your stuff. He wants forgiveness and reconciliation in that relationship. I think that's exactly why Jesus takes that text and puts it right here. When he says those words, that Jewish audience would have been like, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you mean. It showcases forgiveness. Now, you remember the pigs, right? Remember we talked about the pigs, how they were unclean animals. You touch them, they become unclean. Listen, in Luke chapter 8, there's this story about a woman who had an issue of blood. She had an issue of blood. She was bleeding for years and years. Nobody could fix her. And when a woman is bleeding, she is unclean. She would have had to go through certain things to become clean again. But if anyone touches an unclean thing, they become unclean themselves. You touch a pig, you become unclean. But here is the most amazing thing about that story with the woman. She wanted to touch the hem of his garment. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. And when she does, what happens is the opposite of what should happen. Jesus should become unclean because he ends up touching an unclean thing. But because Jesus is so pure and so wonderful and so amazing and so holy, when she touches him, power, he says this, power has left me, power comes from him onto her and she becomes clean. And so then we see this wonderful picture of the father embracing the son, hugging, kissing, pouring out his compassion on the son. I think that's what happens. The father's embrace causes this son to become clean again. Now, it doesn't tell us that specifically in the story, but I think it's a wonderful picture of this son who's coming back, walking back, covered in junk and mud and pig, and he's totally unclean on so many levels, yet the father runs and embraces him, and there's some amazing, wonderful moment in this return. Now, here's another pattern change from the first two Parables. The sheep and the coin did not return on their own. The sheep had to be found by the shepherd and brought back. The coin had to be found by the woman and brought back. The son, this younger brother, comes to himself, gets up, and goes to his father. So we have his rebellion, we have his return, and now, this is the really good part, we have his restoration. So here we go. He's there, he's being embraced, it's wonderful. And he starts the speech. Remember he's practicing the speech. I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer, he probably been practicing this whole time. When he's walking, he's like, okay, Father, I want someone, okay, Father, I'll get this right. You know, he's gotta get it right. So he gets some of it out, and then the father cuts him off. He's like, nope, not listening to that. And he tells the servants, Hey, servants, go get some stuff. Tells him three things to get other than the fatted calf. There's three gifts that are given to the son. And this is important. Jesus wouldn't include things in a story if they weren't important. This is what he gives him. He gives him a robe. 
It represents belonging in the family or even righteousness. And we see that throughout Scripture. We are clothed in righteousness. We are clothed in Christ. We put on Christ because we belong to the family. That's what that robe represented, belonging in the family. Then he puts on a ring. It represents authority and position. Pharaoh takes off his ring, puts it on Joseph because he has authority. In the story of Esther, the king seals a declaration with his ring because that is the king's authority. And so he puts that ring on the son because he has authority and position in the family. And the third thing is sandals. This represents the sign of the son of the owner. Servants didn't get shoes, sons got shoes. And if you look throughout scripture, you'll see shoes has something to do with the rights, with your rights. You go to Ruth, there's a story about how uh, someone has to take off their shoe when they're giving up their right to do something. Remember the story of the burning bush? He walks up and God tells him to do what? Take off your shoes because it's holy. And we might think, oh, I've got to be barefoot on holy ground. Is that right? I think it's because God says, you want to come to me, you're going to have to remove the right you have, your humanity, your selfishness, all that you are, give that away and come to me fully ready to be connected to me. So it gives him the robe, the ring, and the sandals to showcase that he's not a servant. And remember those hired servants? He said, I'm not gonna be worthy to be called your son. Just make me a servant in your house. You see, the younger brother just wanted that. That's all he wanted, just make me a servant. But the father did not hear any of that. He restored him back to his position as a son and did not say, okay, you can just work for me. That's not how it worked. You are restored, forgiven, redeemed, restored. You see, the father offered forgiveness to the son. I think that's, again, we talked about that running to him, embracing him, making, that's forgiveness, making us new. We are forgiven. He is forgiven. But then he restores him to being forgiven. A son. He's not a slave. He's not a servant. He is a son. So we have his rebellion, his return, and his restoration. His rebellion, his return, and his restoration. Now here's the thing. You see, we all have been and maybe are currently the younger brother. We've all been the younger brother. We've all rebelled and wanted our own way. Pastor Steve talked about it last week. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us, every single one of us, we've all rebelled, but we can all be restored to that position in the family of God. You see, the key is the pattern change in this story. Remember what I said, the sheep, the coin didn't rebel and the sheep and the coin didn't return on their own. There is a key component here with this return. He comes to himself and he says, I will get up and I will go. In all my shame, in all my uncleanliness, in all my junk, in all my problems, I'm, I'm lonely, I'm broke, I'm hungry, I'm alone and I'm gonna get up and go to my father. He doesn't say, you know what? My dad will forgive me. He'll let me back in the house. It'll be fine. That's not what he says. He just wants to be a servant because he feels unworthy. He feels cast out. He feels rejected. But he gets up and he goes. And here's the most wonderful thing. You see, when we turn towards God, he runs towards us. See, that's the beautiful picture of this story. It's not simply a younger son returning to the father. I mean, that'd be a fine story. He walks up on the porch, dad, I'm sorry. And he's like, all right, you know, go work the field. That'd have been all right. He would have let him back in the house and made sure he was taken care of. But that's not what this father does. This father runs to his son. 
embraces him, forgives him, sets him free, and sets him up as his son because he says, this son of mine was lost and is found. He was dead and is alive again. That's this story. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says this. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children, and we are. That we should be called God's children. I've preached the prodigal son numerous times over the years. And you know, it is about receiving sinners. It's set up in that structure. It's about receiving sinners. But so much more, it's about a father's love for his lost children. It's about a father's love. You know, you might be here today and you're thinking, you know, I'm doing all right. I don't, I don't really need this story. I mean, it's nice, pigs and whatnot, but I don't really need this. I'm, I'm good to go. Or you might be saying the complete opposite. I'm a mess. I feel like I'm sitting in the pig pen right now and I don't know what to do. And I would say, no matter where you are or what's going on in your life, the Father is waiting expectantly for you to come to yourself, to have the light bulb turned on and say, no matter what comes to your mind, I, I'm not worthy. I'll just be one of the servants. I'll just, I, I'm full of shame and muck and junk. No matter what comes to your mind, what he wants you to do is say, I will get up. I will go to my father and I will say, and then the father stops and says, this is my son. He was lost and it's found. He was dead and is alive. You see, that is the thing about Christianity. It's not about bad people becoming good. It's about dead people becoming alive. Now you may be in here and you've been a Christian for years. And you're like, I'm not lost. I'm not, I'm not lost. It kind of reminds me of this idea that you've been hiking for years and years and one day you take a wrong turn and all of a sudden you're lost. And you can't tell yourself that you're lost because you've been hiking for years. I don't get lost. We all get lost. Sometimes it's clear, painfully obvious, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we're sitting in a famine in a field full of pigs. And sometimes we're sitting at home watching television and we just can't tell that we're lost. But on this day, I want to extend this story to you and remind us all that whether we've been lost forever, whether we found Jesus and we've gotten lost again, whatever it is, the Father says, come to me. Come, turn towards me. Just make that turn. That's what repentance is all about. Make that turn towards the Father. And the Father says, I will run to you. In the midst of your shame, in the midst of your junk, in the midst of your chaos, God will run. So think about that today as we pray. Think about God, the great Father, running to his children.